Hey guys, this is James from Computer Headquarters, and uh, this is sort of an informal look at the uh, Tech Cooler. Uh, it's a thermoelectric conduction cooler. To quickly explain the thermoelectric cooler, it basically is like a sandwich where there is an extreme amount of heat being passed over one side from this guy here, uh, and it causes the other side to be cooled um, through what's called the Peltier effect. Uh, you can look it up more on Wikipedia. It's like a pretty fascinating topic. So the cold part is able to get the CPU below ambient because normally without this cooler the radiators are both like it's technically water cooling but it's actually air cooling because the water is being cooled by the air the water is just a different method of moving the heat around but it's actually being cooled by the air in this case it's being cooled by something other than the ambient air the loop itself is being used to cool the hot side of the sandwich so to speak in the cooler um, i'm by no means an expert on the technology so i'm not really going to give you like a professional review of it because I don't fully understand it. Um, I'm just playing around with it because I have the opportunity to do that because my boss is crazy. <laughs> Shake it off. The build is, this is a ROG Strix Helios case and the whole thing is powered by a ROG Strix Thor 1200 watt power supply. We have a uh, RTX 3090 here. It's, we haven't really even played with that part yet. Uh, this is a ROG Strix Z590-A. And then this inside here is an Intel Core i9-10900K. It's a pretty decent sample, in my opinion. The whole thing is cooled by this whole custom loop that goes to the tech cooler here. And the tech cooler is an interesting cooler because the loop isn't cooling the CPU, the loop is cooling the cooler, and then the other side of the cooler is cooling the CPU. And we're gonna take a look at just overclocking with it and what kind of results you can get out of it and talk about, I guess, why, why you would even consider grabbing this product. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it's a $350 cooler and it pulls about 180 watts while it's operating. Um, in addition to the crazy power draw of the rest of the components in the build, you're looking at a really heavy investment here uh, to pick this up and play with it. There's no reason to do this build whatsoever unless you just want to. Uh, this is definitely something you do for the fun of doing it. Here we have our uh, Cinebench and hardware info open. As you can see, we're chilling at uh, 5.9 gigahertz, which is pretty cool. You can see the, uh, the vid here is requesting a crazy amount of voltage. That's kind of scary. It's not so bad yet. Wait until we put some stress on it. You can see the CPU temperatures are at zero. It's actually pretty unusual if you've never seen this kind of cooler before. They're actually likely lower than zero, but it can't report negative values, so we're just at zero. And uh, just to note, this is pretty much for show at 5.9. This sample is never gonna run this in any kind of realistic workload. Uh, once this passes around six Celsius, it'll downclock pretty hard. And uh, I'll go actually go ahead and show that to you right now. This is running Cinebench here on a single core, which is the ideal use for this cooler. Uh, this is actually kind of low. This is the control panel for the tech cooler, by the way. You can see it's in cryo mode here, which is uh, basically on. And you can see it's drawing 173 watts, measuring, or it's rather estimating the dew point and the showing us the temperature of the cooler itself. Oh, there we go. So 5.4 to 5.6 is around what I've achieved with this cooler for like a one or two core workload. Um, that's the whole point of this cooler and the reason that it's interesting or fun for this CPU is because 10th and 11th gen feature what Intel calls thermal velocity boost, which uh, if you know anything about Ryzen CPUs, it's literally just precision boost, um, where it, it has two cores that Intel labels as like higher binned cores that have a lot of potential that scale really well with optimal thermal conditions. So like under 70 Celsius, it'll run, you know, a higher clock and then under 40 Celsius, etc. it's more stable. And you can see here, single core benchmark, we're at four Celsius and we're holding pretty decent uh, clock rate. And uh, yeah, the previous score you can see it was 571 here for single core. It's gonna take a while to complete this, so I'm just kind of showing it to you. This cooler is interesting in that it's not particularly good for uh, all core workloads, which I can demonstrate as well. It's like, EK says on their own website that this is intended for gaming only or like really light workloads and not not at all for all core or it's, it actually warns against using prime 95 or anything of the sort with this cooler which is kind of funny it makes you wonder what the point of it is really for a regular user but then it's like well like i explained before it's not really for a regular user it's for someone who really likes to play with bios settings so I'll actually talk about that show you the sheer insanity of setting this up from the bios here and you can see our xmp enabled um, i like xmp2 over one for Asus motherboards because it's the actual XMP 
XMP1 claims to be uh, optimized by Asus's motherboard. I don't really know what that means. They don't specify, so I don't trust it. Um, I could look it up, but I don't care. Uh, Multi-core enhancement here. Is this removing the limits from the CPU? So it's like where you normally see in here, the power limits are maxed out at 4,095 watts. Obviously that's not achievable. It's just, you know, basically as high as it can go. And here's our other menu, it's kind of fascinating. This is what you're gonna spend if you buy this for whatever reason, most of the time with. This is 59, as in this is the multiplier. And this is the number of cores that I'll try to hold the multiplier at. And you can scale it so it's six cores, it holds 5.3. And 10 cores holds 5.1 because, I mean, you're, you're never gonna hold 5.9 on all 10 cores. Not without a, a more extreme cooling solution, but if you if you know what that is, you're not watching this video. And in addition to that, there's the thermal velocity boost menu here. You can see it's uh, got estimates for us of like what we were setting up earlier, right? With uh, active cores, the ratio setting, and then the temperature targets. And then uh, there's this infinitely long menu here where you can play with different temperatures, uh, different offsets for different temperatures. And uh, this, is, it's, this is an incredible amount of time to get this stable. It's actually a huge waste of time in my opinion, unless you actually think this is fun, which I just happen to. Um, one really interesting thing to note also is that on the AI prediction thing that Asus has over here on the bottom right, it's uh, saying that we need 1.7 V-Core to run uh, 5.9 all core. This is actually like incorrect. Um, Asus just caps it at 1.7 because that's the, the motherboard cap. So like if we tried to adjust it, like for example, go to here, you can set this to like something stupid, right? Like 7.0 and it should update. There it is. See, it still requests, it says it's, it says it's gonna require 1.7 V core to hit 7.0. That's not true. And then uh, you can set my adaptive voltage. It sets at 1.55. This is what I've got stable for these settings. And yeah, that's about it for our BIOS tour here. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what it looks like when it's running all core. Gotta enable our cooler again. Whoa. So one of the things I'll talk about this cooler, that's kind of frustrating for me, and uh, it might be how I have it set up or whatever, but every now and then, this guy down here will default to standby. It turns off. It actually throws me an error code, uh, DT1. If you know what that is, please leave a comment. Um, it says that the temperature health sensor, or the health of the temperature sensor is like poor and that you need to recheck how it's plugged in. Uh, I've checked multiple times and it doesn't always do this, but every now and then it'll just like default and give me that error code. And if that was like in the middle of you doing something where you need the cooler to be actively cooling, that's like kind of a problem. Uh, you also have unregulated mode down here which you can see uh, may cause condensation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's like a rubber block around the tech cooler to shield um, all the sensitive components from condensation in case it does occur. But it's just, you know, they're just saying it's a risk depending on where you live, your humidity, etc. So this happens when you actually fully stress the CPU. You can see my offset is taking care of it pretty okay. We dip from 5.9 all the way down to 5.0, or 4.9 even. It fluctuates a little bit. Temperatures are okay, but I mean, here you're looking at literally the same performance or maybe even worse performance than having like a typical all-in-one cooler, um, like something much cheaper and much more usable attached. And uh, again, just, just to reiterate, I guess, this, this is only worth it for the fun of playing with benchmarks and bio settings. You're, you're not looking to buy this to get better frame rates in games or anything like that or especially if you're doing professional work, it's not going to help. This is a pretty standard score for the CPU, like we're talking stock even. So just real quick, this is stock settings uh, for this particular CPU with the Intel power limits enforced. And I actually wanted to show you the uh, single core benchmark for this and just show you like the percentage uplift that you're gonna get from dropping uh, money and time endlessly into a build like this. and kind of like help you make your decision. Spoilers, it's it's not amazing. So at the end of our run here, you can see that we are at 524 points. If you remember previously, we're at 571 with the tech cooler at 5.5-ish gigahertz. So 
$350 for the cooler and the required additional 180 watts to run the cooler and almost sacrificing all core performance to gain essentially 9% uh, in lightly threaded workloads. Uh, yeah, can't say that's fantastic, but I will say that this is super fun to play with. Uh, I had a lot of fun like messing around with it and it's really cool just to see 5.9 gigahertz or maybe you can even get higher. Um, just like as a readout in hardware info and that that pretty much wraps up the video. Sorry for rambling this this whole build has just fried my brain and I've spent so much time on it that I, I don't know how to bring it together. But like I said, you know informal review and uh, We're gonna try throwing an 11900k in it and see what happens And that should be pretty fun Cool Do that Now I have to take it away she was streaming herself watching YouTube videos. Yep. <laughs> to be fair though, some people get away with it in the next five years, but... And it'll lose so legal. To be honest, it's a little too big brain. Then you need to turn it down. I'll die. Uh... <laughs> so this here is the 11900K on the tech cooler as well. Um, this is a really frustrating experience for me uh, overall, this CPU. Uh, I actually can't get XMP to run on this. Uh, oh, check that out. The sensor detected error guy that I was talking about earlier popped up. Um, the cooler is now in standby mode, which is kind of bad because, well, not dangerous, but you know, it's just, it's not, it's not working, right? I mean, it's, uh, anyways, so. I can only really hit 5.4, maybe 5.5 single core on this thing um, with a decent amount of work put into it. Um, partly is no doubt my experience or lack thereof with the CPU. Uh, it might also be the motherboard. I don't know, this is totally new to me and I'm just winging it, but the results are just a lot less exciting uh, numbers wise than the 10900K. But the result, uh, the benchmark score is actually significantly better, uh, at least for single core but it's no better than, let's say, uh, a, a certain other uh, red CPU at the same price point. So just something to consider if you're thinking of buying one. Um, if you really like overclocking, I think it's a very fun CPU as well, like the 10900K. I know they use the word frustrating just now, but um, frustration is overclocking. I mean, if you know, it's, it's how it is. So just to summarize our experience here and my incredibly in insane rambling, uh, the tech cooler and the 10900K or 11900K, the water loop and all this um, pretty much amounts to not very much performance increase. This kind of investment is literally only worth it uh, for the fun of it. If you enjoy overclocking and you're bored of all-in-one coolers or whatever kind of other cooler, this is a new kind of tech uh, that's fun to play with, uh, pun intended. And, um, you know, for more computer content, uh, check us out on YouTube.